my name is Jack Murphy. Uh, most of you on the call uh, know who I am. Um, I am the chair of the North Fulton Improvement Network that used to be the North Fulton Poverty Task Force. We've actually, even though we have a new name, we've been around for about five years and we had been working, when I say we, it was probably a group of anywhere from 50 to 70 nonprofits, business leaders, community leaders, uh, faith groups, uh, and folks working on trying to make life a little bit easier for people that are in financial vulnerability. We weren't calling them that at the time, we were calling it actually poverty. Uh, and that's why it was in our uh, title. But we discovered uh, a year or two ago by getting some students involved and a couple of other things that most people in North Fulton don't think that as, as a place that has poverty. And so we did a study, we uh, unveiled it last November at a summit that many of you attended uh, at Mount Pisgah Church. There were 200 people that attended. And that's where we started to discover that this idea of financial vulnerability. At the time, there were perhaps 29,000 people that were below the technical federal poverty level living in North Fulton, which we define as anything above the perimeter, roughly. Uh, and we looked at studies and we found pockets of poverty that were rather pronounced, some of which had grown uh, 10 or 11% over the previous 10 years at a time when the economy was doing well. So we thought, how can we better educate our neighbors and our community about this need? Uh, knowing that we needed to get all sectors of the community involved for everyone from people with lived experience to people in the business community, job creators, uh, who ultimately have the creative uh, ways of solving some of these challenges. And so we decided to launch the uh, rebrand ourselves and work on five areas of financial vulnerability. That's affordable housing, income workforce, child well-being, transportation, and food insecurity. And we have work groups in each of those five areas that have been formulating and honing short, medium, and long-term solutions to these problems. And one of the things that those work groups also do is help us put together public facing events like this one today. And so I am so happy that you have joined us for our first fireside chat that is going to be facilitated by Nisha Mason. Nisha, Nisha is uh, the executive director of the Drake House. And many of you know the Drake House, but what you may not know about Nisha is that she has 20 years. Uh, so she must have started when she was six um, in the public and private sector, uh, both doing nonprofit work and uh, in the education world. But she also, and this one just floored me, is the former mayor of Abilene, Kansas. Um, and that's a rarity in the nonprofit world in my experience. So that makes her rather unique. But Nisha will be joining us in a few minutes uh, to uh, help us um, uh, facilitate the questions. But the, the, the real star of the show today is Alex. Uh, Alex um, is with the Federal Reserve and uh, has a, a very uh, varied background in, um, uh, well, Alex, let me start by, would you tell us a little bit about the department you are in or the area of the Federal Reserve that you are in? Sure, good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be here and talk to this group. Um, I'm talking to you right now from the edge of Fulton County. Um, you know, so I'm at, I'm at, I live on the border of uh, DeKalb and Fulton County, so I'm very close. Um, but I work in Fulton County, of course, at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. Now, at the, you know, the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, we have some core responsibilities that you've probably heard of, right? And I'll just review them very quickly. So we have the, the monetary policy function, right, which is about stable prices and maximal employment. We focus on ensuring the stability of the financial system. We focus on facilitating the payment system in the country, the retail payment system. And we also focus on community and economic development. Right? And that goes back of, of course, to the Community Reinvestment Act, which was designed to encourage banks to, or in, well, encourage banks 
to make credit available to all communities, especially low and moderate income communities. Now, what that work now entails in community and economic development, which is where I sit, which is part of the research department at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, is that we focus broadly on economic and financial issues faced by low and moderate income families. At the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, that typically focuses on workforce development challenges and opportunities, which is my particular interest, affordable housing, entrepreneurship and small business, and then more generally community engagement, working with communities so that they can get the resources they need to create and have successful collective impact strategies. So that's where I said community economic development. Great. Well, Alex, if you'll launch into your presentation, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Sure, great. Now, I thought I would start out um, this morning with a few slides, everyone, just because I wanted to talk a little bit about how we've been thinking about financial vul vulnerability as of late, at least in the community and economic development and in the research division at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. This is an important topic because I'm not sure if everyone on the, on the call has heard that one of our strategic priorities now at the bank, so one of our three core strategic priorities, right, not just for community and economic development, but for the entire bank, is to promote economic mobility and resilience. And, and that's, that's pretty impressive for a, an institution like the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta to take on that strategic goal. So some of this work you're gonna to see today is really closely intertwined and directed at us achieving that goal. So just a moment as I share my screen. Again, thank you everyone, it, as I said, it, it's great to be here today. Just, of course, the comments I'm about to make today do not necessarily represent the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, the Federal Reserve System. They are my own comments. I'd like to first just present some statistics that we're all familiar with. Right? What's the current context that families are facing in Fulton County? Right? And this right now is Fulton overall. You've seen this statistic in the news. So this is initial unemployment claims each month going from January to July, which was the most recent data we had available in this data set. We know there was a large spike in unemployment insurance claims in April at the, at the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then those initial claims have been dropping, of course. So fewer people are applying for those initial claims but it doesn't necessarily mean they aren't continuing to receive those claims. The next slide gives us a sense of the unemployment rate in Fulton County. And this is the you know, standard un unemployment rate. Right? And we again see that peak in April, but it, a little bit of a flatter decrease in May, June, and July. So we still have a, a, you know, an unemployment rate that's at about 10% as of July in Fulton County. Now that's, you know, again, uh, uh, important amount of context to think about the COVID-19, right? So we have employment, unemployment loss and what's happening is a lot of institutions we talk to are right now thinking about, well, how is that affecting families? And what are gonna be the opportunities for families to not only stabilize their situation right now, of course, but to start thinking about the opportunities they'll have to return to work and perhaps jobs that provide more security and more paths to economic security. A statistic has not often shown as much as just, well, what's going on with the social safety net right, in Fulton County? So people are losing their jobs or alternatively, families are in jobs that are either part-time that are not providing a, a sufficient wage to pay their, their basic expenses. So they use safety net programs to provide financial stability and support their families. The figures you see on your screen are from the state of Georgia and it's showing us the enrollment in Fulton County for four programs. Right? 
Households receiving med medical coverage, so that's going to be through Medicaid programs. Houses, households receiving food assistance through SNAP, the Su Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. And then we have households receiving TANF, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, and then child-only cases receiving TANF. So only the children would be receiving TANF. Now we focus on the top two charts, and this is actually pre-peak COVID, right? just so everyone knows. I thought it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's important to know that we had about 70 to 80,000 individual households receiving Medicaid coverage in Fulton County. We had about 80,000 households receiving SNAP benefits with an average benefit of about $300 a month for food. From statistics I've seen on other states that had the more recent data available, these numbers do pick up and quite substantially in COVID. Right, or, or even post COVID, you know, up to, you know, through July, August, even. Okay. This is important because it sets the context a little bit on the financial stability of families in Fulton County. Right? And what is the, what are some of the challenges they're going to face as they begin to move past these financial assistance programs into workforce development programs and economic security. Okay. I'd like us to think about a uh, case study to think about this child. Now let's imagine we have a, a young single parent, two children, lives in Atlanta, right? and her children are ages four and six. Let's say post COVID, she was making about $9 an hour in food services. You know, so kind of a concessions job, perhaps at a movie theater, as you see on the, the little graphic on your screen right now. Now, let's say she's trying to say, well, how do I pay my basic expenses now? But at the same time, how do I improve my family's financial security? What can I do? What are the opportunities for me? Let's also say Leah is receiving a degree of public assistance programs. Common tax credits, such as the earned income tax credit, the child tax credit. Let's say, like the statistics I just showed you, right, from the state of Georgia, let's say she's receiving SNAP coverage, and let's say she's receiving healthcare subsidies, right? So Medicaid for her children, Affordable Care Act perhaps. So she's on public assistance programs, right? She's using that money to help pay her basic expenses right now. Let's furthermore say, you know, since I work in workforce development, that Leia looks up some of the in-demand occupations in the Atlanta area, right? So not just full. County, but let's think about it a little bit more broad in terms of the labor market. So she goes to one of the workforce work source Georgia websites. She does some kind of career interest assessment, realizes she's interested in the healthcare field, and she sees, well, you know what? There's two occupations here that seem to offer a career ladder, right? not only at the entry level, but toward more earnings in the future, right? So, and perhaps a path to economic self sufficiency. I've pointed out two in this slide, let's say that licensed practical nurse job. Okay? So an LPN, that's about a one year educational program, very rigorous. And then a little bit higher up this healthcare career pathway, we have the registered nurse program. Okay? That's about a two, typically a two year degree program, again, very intensive. But if a worker is able to become a registered nurse, it's very likely they're gonna be at an economic, economically self-sufficient wage. So again, let's, let's all just imagine Leia went into the, these job centers or visited them online, was learning about these programs and now has some decisions to make. Okay. Now, what we have on your screen right now is the self-sufficiency standard for a, a single parent, a school-aged child and a preschool child, aged child in Fulton County. And let's just take a moment to look at some of these numbers. These numbers represent how much Leia will have to pay in each of these expenses to maintain a, 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 not a bare bones standard living, but an adequate standard of living, according to this very rigorous research methodology from the University of Washington. These standards are very similar, if you're not familiar with the University of Washington standards, are very similar to the United Way's ALICE thresholds and the MIT living wage data, if you've seen those other metrics. 
What this says is that Leah would probably need, likely need to spend in Fulton County about $1,200 a month on housing, about $1,300 a month on childcare, about $680 on food. Remember that average SNAP benefit I mentioned a few slides ago was about 300, about $95 on transportation, about $377 in miscellaneous expenses such as clothing for her children, healthcare of about $444, and think about an employer premium perhaps for a family. And then she's gonna get some money back in those tax credits. So we have the child tax credit and the child care tax credit that she would get back. Now this is important because at least the way we've been approaching a lot of our work is we're thinking about what are the, as many others are, what are the career paths that provide viable entry-level jobs for workers in terms of career paths to earnings amounts that provide for self-sufficiency standard wages? Right? How do we get workers successfully up those career paths into jobs that allow them to achieve this economic self-sufficiency standard. By no means is it an easy challenge. Um, in fact, it requires a, a systems of approach, it requires employers, it requires a lot of thought on these career paths. And this has been a lot of our attention lately. Now, now let's say, you know, that in mind, Leia, you know, she's determined she wants to go on this, this healthcare career path, that LPN job and that RN job. Now that career pathways model that's so dominant in community and workforce development wants to put workers first in an entry-level job in the sector. Right? And the theory, of course, is that at these entry-level jobs, workers are going to be able to go without too much educational prerequisites, start work, get acclimated to the work environment of the sector. And then once those jobs are established, you can build up your skill set and gradually move up to the higher paying job. Right. It's, a, it's a path of career advancement. Now, the question for us, and certainly how I've been thinking about the design of these programs is, will it pay off for Leia, first of all, to go up this healthcare career pathway? And second, what's that financial vulnerability picture of Leia as she does move up this career pathway? And then what can we do as a system to support Leia as she moves up that career pathway? Let's first think about it in a, the most simplistic sense. Imagine Leia is given a set of in, you know, statistics about these jobs to say, you know what, Leia, this is how much you're gonna earn. At a median wage right now in your concessions job or your food services job, you're making about $20,000 a year. If you get to that entry level job as a CNA, you're gonna make about $28,000 a year, which is an improvement. Secondly, if you make it to this one year program, there's some excellent programs in the Atlanta area that are built on this career pathways model. If you get to that LPN program, you'll make about $45,000 a year. The takeaway from this is that career advancement is a clear payoff, right? However, what we like to point out is of course that this is going to mask some of the challenges, right? It's gonna mask the challenge of what happens when Leia starts to lose her public assistance. That's the so-called benefits cliff phenomenon many of you may have heard of. As your income goes up, you of course lose eligibility for public assistance. Sometimes that loss will, out, will, um, will outweigh your gains in income, right? That's a major challenge. And at the same time, it doesn't think about the financial vulnerability that Leia would be in as she climbs up this career path and struggles to pay basic expenses. So we're gonna to try to present this in a little bit more holistic way to think about. This chart's a, a little complex, but it's, it's a useful segue into how we think about this program. Now, remember I just showed you three boxes with median wages on them, right? What this slide does is we're gonna take that in a sense, the same data, but put it into more of a career planning approach. What does that mean? So notice on the horizontal axis of this figure, we have Leia's age, starting at age 25, going up to age 45. So we're now looking at her overtime income. On the vertical axis, we just have that same gross employment income. However, one thing this chart changes is we're now starting at the starting wage and allowing income to grow over time 
as Leia gains more experience in the occupation. Notice that the lines dip down here. So this green line dips down at age 27 because we're gonna assume that Leia has to drop down to part-time work in order to go to school full-time to complete this LPM program. So your gross income is gonna drop somewhat. And then you would start as an LPN just following this green line at age 28 and stay an LPN for your rest of your career. The other two lines are important as comparisons. So this red line represents, well, what if Leia or workers like Leia stay in these near minimum wage jobs for the rest of their career? We can see there's actually not much income growth. And gross income never really is going to exceed about $20,000 for Leia. The orange line says, well, what if she becomes a CNA, that entry level job and stays a CNA for the rest of her career? Again, it's better than the minimum wage job, but it's still not to the LPN job. Right? Now this career planning approach allows us to see that the LPN is gonna pay off, but it's gonna miss a couple things that I wanna add on. The first is, well, let's, take, let's go back to that University of Washington self-sufficiency standard. That standard for a worker like Leia in Fulton County is about $56,000 a year is what she needs to make to reach the, the self-sufficiency standard. Notice not a single one of these lines ever crosses $56,000. Uh, $56, the green lines tops out at about 50. Now that's a, that's a, I don't want to diminish the importance of making $50,000 a year, but as a benchmark, if we want to think about these self-sufficiency standards in Fulton County, right? the career path has to have another step, right? As is these occupations are not gonna get us there. LPN is close, but look how far away that CNA job is and the near minimum wage job are from economic self-sufficiency. And this provides some insight why workforce system participants so frequently in programs where they haven't seen success end up stuck in these entry level jobs. Just look at the CNA job. Imagine being approximately $30,000 below the self-sufficiency standard and being asked to upskill by going into another program and taking time away from your family and your children and your current job. You're under a lot of financial stress in that situation, right? And it's, it's hard enough for someone in total financial security to complete a rigorous program like the LPN. For someone in, a, in that type of financial vulnerability, it's even harder. And in fact, evaluations of workforce development programs show this time and again, when they ask people, why did you stay at the entry level job or not complete the job training? It's these financial barriers and financial burdens, these time constraints that families face as they try to climb up these career paths. Now let's look at it in a little bit more holistic way. And this is gonna get a little bit into the benefits cliffs phenomenon. Right? Now, our approach typically frames it as such, looking at employment income alone is not a, is not a sufficient picture of the family's financial well-being. And I'll say that again. So employment income alone is not a financial picture of the family's well-being. So instead, we are now looking at this metric called your, well, what's the family's net financial resources? We define that as the amount of money you get from public assistance, plus the amount of money you get from employment income, minus what you pay in taxes, minus what you pay in expenses. So we just saw the expenses in that University of Washington self-sufficiency standard, right? So what's your leftover in a sense disposable income? Now I'm gonna show you in the next slide, that same chart with those overtime career paths, but instead looking at this net financial resources measure. And I want everyone to just, you know, take a second and see how much different it looks. This is what Leia's financial situation would actually look like if she were embarking on this career path. So we have the same three lines, the red line staying at a near minimum wage job, the CNA, which is the orange line, and then the LPN, which is the green line. Notice a couple things first. This is a far more complex picture. 
So perhaps we were thinking Leia would have this very smooth income growth over time. And that's what we would tell her, well, here's what you'll get if you finish this career pathway. When in reality, this is the, the, the path that she would face in terms of this overall financial well-being for her family. I put on this chart, the break-even line. What the break-even line represents is if any of these lines is below the break-even point, it says that Leia does not have sufficient financial resources to pay her basic expenses. So from age 25 to roughly 33 in this career pathway, she was not able to pay her basic expenses according to that self-sufficiency standard, right? At, at that level of expenses. Now that's, that's an important component because it shows, well, if you're in these CNA programs and LPM programs, you're probably gonna need some community or, it, or further institutional or personal support to help mitigate some of these financial barriers early on in your career. Well, what's, what's happening here? Now the combined increase in tax payments, the loss of programs such as SNAP and Medicaid coverage, creates a few different challenges that are oftentimes hard to see for workers like Leia. And we can think about these as sort of in, in, invisible barriers to advancement, right? And economic mobility. If we start on the far bottom left of this chart, this red line represents what we call a benefits plateau. So notice that this line is essentially flat or decreasing from age 25 to 31. What's happening is as in that minimum wage job, even though her income is going up a little bit every year, she's gradually losing the both earned income tax credit and SNAP coverage, which is basically making her no better off financially every year. So it's a, it's a position of stagnation. In the LPN line, if we move up the chart, this green line we can see represents a true benefits cliff over a couple of years. So that green line drops down considerably from between age 29 and 31. And what's happening is Leia is losing access to children's health care insurance and child care subsidies. So she begins to earn enough, I'm sorry, not child care subsidies, children's health care insurance. So what's happening is that she earns enough a couple of years out on this path where she now has to move her children onto an employer sponsored plan, right? And that's gonna result in a large reduction in net financial resources. And that's something that would be hard to see when we were planning this pathway early on. Lastly, notice that at the top of this figure, the, there's the, the gap between the green line and the orange line is a little, lot smaller. In other words, there's a less financial incentive to even advance to the LPN in the first place. I'm gonna go back a couple slides really quick. Notice how much higher the green line is than the, the orange line here. That's telling us that the payoff to becoming an LPN is significant in terms of employment income. But in this net financial resources measure, when we account for the benefits gained and lost when you're either a CNA or an LPN, there is now not much financial incentive to advance. Right? And you can imagine a worker that's able to actually get that credential as an LPN move into this occupation and then realize she may not be that much better financially off overall, that's not a, an optimal situation for the worker to be in. Certainly in terms of trust for the educational institutions and the community that supported her on this path. Now, over the long term, these pathways are gonna significantly pay off for Leia. And notice that over time, this green line greatly exceeds the other career paths. And that's because of the LPN over time is gonna pay off. Right? So oftentimes it's about overcoming these short-term barriers and thinking about, well, how do we mitigate the short-term barriers so the worker can have these long-term gains? I'll conclude by saying that there's an alternative way to look at this. So we've been talking about the worker's perspective, but we also wanna talk about, well, what's the gain to kind of the taxpayer, right? One, we're able to support workers moving up career paths like we just saw. Now, this bar chart does is show us, well, what's the gain to the taxpayer in terms of Leia's increased tax contributions plus the savings on public assistance expenditure when Leia no longer needs that public assistance? So if we just focus on the long-term bar over here, we just at this gold bar for simplicity, 
what this is telling us is that the taxpayer, federal and state, would gain about $130,000 over the lifetime just from Leia advancing from the CNA job to the LPN. That's a, that's a significant gain. To get the total gain to the taxpayer, you actually would have to add up this red bar and the gold bar. So in total, over the long term, if Leia goes from the near minimum wage job to an LPN, the taxpayer is going to save over $200,000 just from one worker. This is important because it shows that successful career advancement programs, if they can mitigate those short-term barriers, are payoffs for the worker and the taxpayer. And this is a foundational part of our approach to this work. Some of the ways that we've been talking about this in communities is we've actually been developing customized career planning tools for communities where they could center a type of collective impact strategy, looking at all the careers in their area, identifying how it impacts financially, right? In terms of the metrics I just showed you, so they can trace out what families' financial paths actually look like, identify the resources in the community that can support the workers in those steps so they can get to that point of economic self-sufficiency. I just put some ideas on the screen right now that we're involved with, um, with communities around the Southeast, but also around the country. Thinking about benefits cliffs and identifying where they are. Thinking about how family financial vulnerability and security intersects with workforce development strategic planning and what can be done to better integrate those two fields. And then thinking about policy changes, both local, federal, and state that could potentially support workers in these positions and as they get to financial self-sufficiency. The centerpiece of this work we've been working on in communities, I just thought I'd, I'll conclude with this slide, is our, it's called the career ladder identifier and financial forecaster. And the way this method, methodology works is our community partners tell us the careers they wanna focus on. They tell us the type of families they work with in terms of family composition, public assistance. We then map out the path to self-sufficiency, the benefits cliffs, the taxpayer gains, and then the eligibility thresholds for these programs and provide it to communities so they can make more informed collective decisions about supporting workers towards economic self-sufficiency. And I'll be happy to talk about this work further in the Q&A, but I wanted to give you an idea of how these tools look that we've been working with communities on. I'll conclude by saying, saying thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you, Alex. Um, I think uh, this is, you know, in our work that we do at the Drake House, we work with Leia's um, every day. And I think what you have illustrated in the studies that you have done are examples of the families that we serve on a regular basis. And, and of course, our, we're looking at the housing first model, but recognizing that, um, you, you know, earning potential is a large part of that. And so we do have that workforce development arm. And I guess the biggest question after looking at, um, it was really to see the visual of the trajectory from in just that one career path and the fact that it is a 20 year climb, uh, I think about, um, all of the, the obstacles and the things that that mom might have to overcome, particularly with young children. And so I guess from our perspective, my first question, I guess, would be, I know that we look at, um, you know, stable employment. You mentioned that that's one of the, the uh, indicators for um, economic stability in having sustainable employment. But what does it mean if that sustainable employment is in Leah's case, not enough to live. Um, you know, I, I, I see how that research has come across, but how is that taken into consideration and, and really is uh, sustainable employment a true indicator of economic stability? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we would all, we, first we usually would want our partners to define for us, you know, what they see as the important goals for the families they work with, right? And I, you know, we can't, I don't want to diminish the importance of having just stable employment, right? I mean, I think, you know, for families at any level, 
moving from unemployment or part-time unstable work to a full-time job is a critical step, right? And the public assistance programs are also critical to provide financial stability in the short term, right? It becomes a barrier if they start thinking about the, the and maybe have apprehension about losing those programs. And we hope some of these tools can shed light on the, the benefits to moving on. Now, the, the partners we work with all take the approach that sometimes the job, even though a family's in that entry level job that's not providing, allowing them to pay their basic expenses is not enough for their goals. So they're usually approaching this work in a quality jobs framework, whereas we want to partner with employers that are developing the career paths and provide the kind of benefits and support to employees that can actually guide them beyond those entry level jobs toward the economic self-sufficiency. So my sense is it's actually something our partners are thinking about very deeply, right? So, I mean, providing that short-term support, but identifying the jobs that move them beyond the front lines of employment, particularly in this COVID-19 time, into the jobs that are gonna provide at least something closer to the economic self-sufficiency wage. And that's the strategic planning part that's going on, that I see going on right now around the country. Okay. And I just launched into my question because the information that you've given is so interesting, but I would encourage everyone to please, if you have questions for Alex, uh, post them in the chat and I will gladly share. And Nancy has a question and, and her question is, how does the community become a partner with the Fed and use their formulas to find this kind of local strategy data? We, uh, you know, we're, we're interested in partnering with, with many communities. And obviously, a community in our own county would be would be a fantastic partner. Right? The way it would usually work is we would have some kind of you know kind of more structured discussion about you know what are what are your visions for using this kind of a, approach to your work? Uh, what would you want to achieve? Um, coming up with some agreement about what we need to provide to you so you can achieve those goals, and then signing some. A kind of MOU, we could do this analysis uh, for the community. Uh, so it's at, and it's at a, it's a no cost um, partnership as well, right? We just want to usually what we just say is we for us to do this analysis for our partners, we just have to have a concrete understanding of how they plan to use it and what they hope to achieve, right? And where we're working with communities now on that, that has tended a little bit more towards a cross sector approach. Um, across nonprofits, maybe some employers where they're using the dashboard collectively to identify where these barriers are and what the opportunities are and coming up with some kind of community plan to either enhance some of the programs they already have or implement new ones. Excellent. And so Alex, in your research, have you found that um, there being like for those of us who have workforce development programs and as we are encouraging our families or, or the ones that we work with to start that trajectory of upward mobility. Have you found that, that offering financial incentive to kind of scaffold that benefits cliff or as they go along, has that been a successful model that you've seen? Yes, the, uh, I'll, I'll preface that by saying, I don't think the evidence is as robust as we need it to be on those type of programs. Uh, it's, it's an evolving and I think still developing area of research, right? So what I have seen is that there are some promising practice. There's evidence of success in certain cases. In other, in other cases, the financial barriers may just be so complex that uh, even a phase-out program, or no, I'm sorry, non-financial barriers that a family may face may be so significant that a phase-out program wouldn't work, right? So some of the programs I've seen are um, an interesting pilot program in Florida that phases out the child care subsidy. So if you enroll in a career pathway program, if you get a credential that would actually put you over the eligibility for child care subsidies, they'll use, they, they will use philanthropic funding to phase it out over time, over a three-year period, rather than have it, you lose it immediately. Okay. There's also been some national demonstration projects that have shown some promise around how to phase out um, social security insurance, particularly for youth, right? So youth and youth with disabilities 
who may be receiving kind of some kind of social security disability income may face a uncertainty, right, about moving into employment and potentially losing their health care coverage, they get through that SSI program and Medicare, right? So there's been some, some fantastic national demonstrations on programs that phase out that benefit so they feel more comfortable advancing as well, right? So there is there's a lot of promise, and I think, you know, it, it may, the answer may be going all over the place because there's two components to it. There's the phase out, right, or, or at least finding the community resources that can support the worker as it does phase out, and then explaining it to the worker in advance so they aren't surprised by the loss or they can at least prepare for it financially. And one of my partners calls it the sort of psychological cliff. You know, the, the family has to be comfortable moving off of that program, feeling secure, moving into employment, financially secure in order to take that step, right? So it's not just a financial solution. It's, I, you know, it's always a more of a holistic solution about a strong counseling approach, a strong community approach, and then having that financial solution as well. I think that's such an important um, piece of it, as you said, because that is there is that whole the mindset that you have to shift as you are transitioning into uh, your own stability. Particularly, I think I, I can imagine that particularly losing medical benefits and childcare subsidies. I just think about the families that we serve, because not only are you now having to pay for your medical coverage, but then there's also medical bills in addition to. Um, that you may not have had to have dealt with. And those things are very hard to anticipate. So um, I, I can imagine that definitely there's a mindset there. We have some more questions in our uh, chat box and one of them comes from T. Morris. Uh, you were using CNA as an example. That is a field that does not have enough workers. How as a community do we make it so that the jobs that are needed have wages that will actually meet the threshold needed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's it's definitely a tough um, a tough problem, right? A lot of these entry level jobs we know are in demand, but at the same time are not paying anything close to these self sufficiency wages. Right? The way we've been approaching it is again, I would say twofold, right? And you know, like it, like and like any topic in this field, like there's no easy answer or solution, right? The first is employers want to be able to make the case that. that we need to establish a pipeline of talent from the community into the, into the entry level jobs, right? So we always have the people to fill those entry level jobs, but at the same time, we need the organizational infrastructure and community infrastructure to have the on the job training and incumbent worker training program to move those entry level workers up the chain, up the career pathway so they get closer to self-sufficiency. And that doesn't have to be becoming an LPN, of course. Right. One of these career paths is to get an upskilled CNA credential, right? And those are those are available in the community as well. Now, again, it's not going to get you that University of Washington self-sufficiency wage, but a worker can, even as a CNA, can get a, an enhanced CNA credential, right? With a little bit of incumbent worker training, maybe just even in the hospital itself, right? That will allow them to get beyond that, at least that entry-level CNA wage, right? So that's that's you know a promising approach I would say. Um, it's it's not a a comprehensive solution though. And so you mentioned some of that on the job, um, you know, incentivizing on the job training and that kind of thing. Have you seen? Are there, is there a, an example that you can give um, or a best practice to incent employers to train workers on the job? In in some senses we see a lot of employers that don't need the incentive, right? They've, they've internally realized the need, right? And are in a sense doing it on their own, right? For employers like that, it's really about, is there a way that community organizations or workforce development professionals can share with them best practices or co-invest with them to sort of relieve some of the, for example, the educational burden, right? So co-investment strategies are, have emerged as a best practice where kind of community and philanthropy can take programs that employers are doing and support them, right? And at the same time, provide a pipeline into the entry-level jobs we've just seen, right? Now, there are, ignoring that, that class of program, right, which in what I just described is emerging as an established best practice, right? So you have the employers that are able to develop that internal infrastructure for a successful on-the-job training programs, right? And that includes, I've seen employers using career coaches, 
I've seen employers introducing management awareness programs. So managers are aware of the importance of these career pathways internally for, for all employees okay. and the community contact piece, right? So ensuring that that entry level pipeline of qualified talent is there. Right? And, you know, I, there's plenty of employers that are still trying to overcome that challenge of a reliable supply of entry level talent. Now, outside of that case, right, we, the promising practice I've seen are, are, I'm sure, programs you are familiar with, right? And that, so thinking about the class of work-based learning, you know, there, within that, you have kind of apprenticeship programs, you have on-the-job training programs, you have incumbent worker training programs, right? Apprenticeships are usually paired, of course, this is a review, apprenticeships are usually paired with a industry relevant credential attainment piece. So there's an educational component to it as well as paid employment. On the job training is either just done through the employer or part of the workforce development system. So it'd be funded through federal dollars if it's a new employee. And then incumbent worker training is, you know, again, employers can certainly do this on their own with community partnerships. But through the workforce program, it would be you could get funding as an incumbent worker to avert layoffs, you know, in a sense uh, of workers, right? Or apprenticeships have been a promising model. We we talk about them all the time, and you know, oftentimes the you know the incentive for employers in that case is you know looking at the you know it's kind of South Carolina where I moved to Atlanta from is still a, a sense of gold standard where you know they're providing employers with I think it's still a to a thousand dollars per employee of a tax credit to engage in an apprenticeship program for that employee right in addition to paying for the educational piece right so there's you know with the proper kind of policy support right and the community support piece i think there is there is an emerging best practice for engaging employers on this yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. And I, having had some experience with that whole apprenticeship program, I think that that is a, a very promising model. And we actually have a question in the chat that kind of addresses the, the uh, bring young people along and, and sharing information with young people. And the question is, I would think that sharing teaching this data to young, to high school students could help to start them off on a better path. Do you all work with the Georgia Department of Education or school systems on an educational component along these lines that's a really good question <laughs> yeah that's that's a great question now 95 percent of our work to date has been focused on i would say the adult population right young parents um, older parents um, older adults right increasingly we're thinking about well how can this kind of framework be useful to perhaps a high school either career and technical education audience or just high schoolers in general the way you just mentioned is actually not something we've talked about, but I think that would, if it's in an appropriate career education curriculum or a financial education curriculum, this could be a way to, to a, an alternative way to convey the importance of career choice, career planning and financial planning to, to, uh, to young, uh, young uh, high schoolers. So we have um, at the bank, we do have an economic education department and they focus on, on kind of outreach and financial education and economic education to, to middle school and high schools. This might be a great opportunity to work with them, to think about a curriculum that's built on just that idea. So thank you. I think that is wonderful. And I'm even thinking, you know, for like organizations for us, we serve both the mo mothers and the children. And it's a op perfect opportunity for us to educate our young adults about um, what's out there and the trajectories that they have. And I, I think about, you know, when I go back to that CNA model, CNA to LPN model that you had, and the 20 year trajectory, it seems to me like, you know, you think about with her children being young, and depending upon how young those children are, when she starts, there's childcare that has to come into play. Um, as she's going through all this training and still having to work part time and it seems like if there was a way to close that trajectory a little bit to, to close in and shorten that time frame, uh, because by the time that she reaches a, even close to a livable wage or, or sustainable wage, um, her children will be grown. And I don't know that you know all the different things all the different levels of their growth that, that comes along in between there. Um, it's definitely something to be considered as well. Right, right. And so, 
Go ahead. I just, I, I just wanted to expand on that a little because um, you're talking about the long term in in two ways. So, you know, I didn't even, first of all, I didn't even talk too much about the two gen approach, but I should have given the the group's strategic goals, you know, on, on that kind of the whole family perspective. Without being above that break even line, there's not a lot of money to invest in the in the children, right? You know, in terms of education, childcare. So there's an important piece that, you know, the, the more financial vulnerability this family's in on the career path, there's a potential for less eff less effective two generational outcomes. Right? That gets into a whole nother piece that we didn't show today, and that's the college education of the children. Right. So that those charts I showed you simplistically assumed that the children became financially independent at age 18. Right. And that's because we were more focused on that kind of earlier career piece. But let's say we expanded that model to say, you know what, this this parent's going to invest in a two generational perspective. In that children's college education. Right. So now, you know, some of those financial vulnerabilities may expand out even farther if there's not if there's not effective financial planning and career advancement early on. And in fact, one of the first presentations I gave on this, 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 um, this exact same career pathway was in Florida. And after the presentation, one of the individuals in the audience came up to me, um, uh, uh, it was actually a teacher and said, well, you know what, this happened to me because when my son, well, I, what she said is I took two jobs to help pay my basic expenses. My son lost financial assistance to go to college because of that. So I had to quit my second job so my son would get financial assistance again to go to college. Right. So that's, that's the two gen reality of this. The second thing I wanted to expand on is that some of our partners that we've been working with in the nonprofit space have been at that kind of time frame and saying that maybe this will help us improve our some you know in a sense our argument to to funders that the one two-year program model does not always is not always going to be effective you know we need to have a, a funding model in place that can support programs that are looking you know three four years out right if we if we're serious about these career advancement metrics yeah i think that i definitely think I think that your presentation and the research you've done have illustrated that very well. And I know that you know we are all uh, engaged in this chat so that we can figure out ways that we can bring these solutions to the communities and the families that we serve. And as Stuart, uh, who asked the question about bring it to the high schools, is actually in a position to do so. So if you, uh, she is on the chat and she's with the Board of Education for Fulton County Schools and she's planning to share your presentation with the superintendent and others to continue the conversation. And I think with that, I just will say again, thank you, Alex, for your time and your information and for bringing, I think, what we all deal with on a day-to-day -day basis into a very um, visual and recognizable uh, set of information that hopefully we can all act on. And um, I know we're all wondering how do we move forward? What are your suggestions for how we start to implement um, these best practices in our programs and in our communities? And I know you've spoken to that in several ways throughout this presentation, but if you just want to summarize that really quickly for us, and then um, I guess your contact information I'm sure will be shared. And after you answer, I'll turn it back over to Jack. Thank you again, Alex, for all of your information and sharing your expertise. Uh, th thank you so much for the invitation. It really is an honor to, to get to speak to this group. Uh, I mean, it's, I'm, a, I'm a big supporter of, of the work that this nonprofit community does. Um, I'll conclude by saying that, you know, you know what, what needs to be done. I mean, you need, you need a strategic framework, you know, kind of like, you know, the one we pose today is a framework that says we need to focus this community on three phases of this worker's career. Before they even enter, the community development system, you know, like before they start job training, before they start work, what's their financial and non-financial barriers? What are their barriers when they're in training? And then what are their barriers when they stop training and start working? Right. We need to look at all three of those phases in the work's career and figure out what we need to do to support them. Right. That's one framework I proposed to you today. When you think about, well, what's going to be effective, 
I mean, at this point now, the body of research on kind of what works is, is pretty clear that the community context has to be there. And think about just to make one successful workforce program, you need the infrastructure in terms of the educational system. You need good tech colleges, you need good community colleges, you need good training providers, you need a good K through 12 system, right? You need the community system that's able to connect adults, support adults, support youth as they enter that training system. Right? You need the philanthropy and policy community to fund and connect the dots across those, those different components, right? And then you need the economy and the employers to articulate what their needs are and then be involved in the hiring. Right? Now that that is not my opinion. That's just you know out in in the body of research. And then to do that, you need some kind of community-based strategic plan, either at a broad level or on one specific targeted workforce program. Right. So I mean, my recommendation is to. I mean, you're probably already doing all that, right? Um, in that case, it would be just improving, continuous improvement and refining, you know, to get to either where you, you can improve where you are now or get to where you, you know, desire to be. Well, I, I thank you again for your information and Jack, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Alex, for, for joining us today. It, it was fascinating. I've, I've heard the benefits Cliff explained a number of different times. This time, I think I understood it. So thank you very much for that. Um, you also gave us uh, uh, some great information that we can act on. Uh, in particular, I've been a fan of uh, apprenticeships for a long time. And now that I know that South Carolina uh, does $1,000, we got to see if we can do $2,000. Um, so thank you for joining us, everyone. We have a few more questions that we didn't get to. So we'll try to send those to Alex uh, and send them out afterwards with the recording. Alex, will we be able to distribute your slides as well? Uh, I'll send you my slides uh, right after. Great. We'll... Great. Well, thank you all. We plan on doing something similar to this every month. Next month, we'll be probably talking about childcare, which I think is a, a great segue to, with a two generation approach uh, to solving some of these challenges in our communities. Thank you for joining us and have a great day. Thank you everyone.